Reverend Jackson is coming up first tonight, and we're going to talk about the aftermath of the O.J. trial and verdict, the affirmative action, the Million Man March, Powell for President, and several other things. He's back on Straightforward. He's one of uh, our most influential uh, Americans, and uh, he's coming up. Then later on, on the show tonight, uh, we have a man whose career was built on growing up Italian, a major attraction in top clubs. This guy gives us belly laughs. He has for four decades. I've known him for 25 or 30 years. He's a funny guy, a little nuts, but he's funny. Pat Cooper's here tonight. All of that's coming straight up on Straightforward. He ran for president twice and in so doing inspired millions to join the political process. Uh, from our studios in Burbank, California, founder and president of the National Rainbow Coalition, Reverend Jesse L. Jackson. Reverend Jackson, nice to see you again. Roger, how do you do? How are you doing? Uh, were you out there for the OJ uh, uh, non-event tonight, or what were you out there for? No, I'm out here speaking in some schools, uh, uh, challenging our youth uh, to turn away from drugs and self-destructive behavior, uh, registering some others to vote, uh, and on several college campuses, uh, supporting affirmative action for students to be included that they might be able to graduate and be productive citizens. So we were quite involved, but since I've been here, I've been in touch with uh, Cochran and been in touch with uh, Douglas at uh, that office. Uh, why did they cancel their, their interview tonight? Did they tell you why they canceled that uh, big interview tonight? Well, you know, uh, when I met with them yesterday, I made a very strong appeal to them for them not to do the show in the first place. It seemed to me that that was their disposition. And decision apparently had been uh, made uh, without uh, consultation with them. But when they did meet, apparently the three or four considerations included <coughs> in that there are other uh, trials. Uh, the uh, the on civil docket. trial, uh, he's still facing some civil actions. Is that Indeed, and so anything that he would say would be like public deposition. deposition. It would not make good legal sense to do it, number one. But I thought that beyond the legality of the matter, that since this matter is so raw and so hurtful and so painful, we need some time uh, for healing. We don't want to OD or overdose on, on OJ. We really need, we need some room. Why did he agree to do it in the first place? What was going through his well, mind? I, mean, I, I, I think perhaps there is this, uh, this obsession to try to explain to the, the American public he was so endeared to uh, that he is not that he is not guilty. He, he wants to talk, and it's like wanting to try the case uh, after the after the case. Uh, yeah, I mean, he had a uh, chance to get up on the If he wanted to explain his actions, he had a chance in the courtroom for a year. Uh, I would think that what he ought to do now, frankly, is really spend some more very private, quality time with his children, try to mend the relationship to the extent possible with his with his in-laws, after all, he is the father of two motherless children. Uh, all them spend some time with, with some women from various organizations, figuring out some way to learn more about and then to address the issues of domestic violence and, and wife battering. And I might add, even as we talk right now, there are attempts in the Congress to cut back on legal assistance for women who are battered or victims of violence. If you focus on something that basic, he could make uh, some impact, and it could have some, uh, some redemptive quality. Would he uh, be a joke on that issue, since it was pretty clear he beat up his wife fairly frequently? Do you think he's repented well, on that? He, 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 he would not be a, a joke. If, if you went through the process of, uh, of, of, of repenting and renewal and redemption, uh, you know, in the biblical times, uh, Saul, the killer of Christians, became Paul the great writer precisely because he had been down, he emerged with a new kind of strength. And so often people who have been, say, victims or, or participants in drugs, they emerge as, as a force saying why it's wrong or, or, or why it's bad. And so uh, he would not be a joke on the matter. Matter of fact, he would, it would be good for him and good for the nation for him to address many men who, who will hear him as to why it's just so weak and so wrong and why it has to stop. One of the, uh, <clears throat> one of the problems, and we're going to get into this talking about the racial divide of the trial, but 
Uh, apparently, by polling, most uh, Amer most uh, white Americans believe that he did it. Uh, do you believe most African Americans believe he didn't do it, or were they sending a message to the LAPD and other police departments to get off their backs? Most African Americans with whom I have talked about this matter felt that reasonable doubt uh, uh, was a big factor. So that he was technically uh, and, and, not guilty, but not innocent. And they, well, There's a they difference could between not, not being guilty and innocence. Indeed, and they more or less left that to the jury. Roger, let me say this to you. Uh, Twelve jurors, uh, eight women, uh, uh, nine African Americans, uh, and a white, and, and two Hispanics, uh, an integrated jury uh, made uh, a, a unanimous uh, decision factoring in uh, uh, the race, I mean, the sex violence, uh, factoring in the race factor. They also could not find the 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 the, the, um, the, the knife or the knives or the smoking gun. No primary witness and could not reconcile in their own mind the time frame for one man killing two people with a knife or with knives. And given the information, they made an integrous judgment about reasonable doubt. It seems to me to be so unfair for this jury's intelligence and integrity and motivation to be challenged the way that is, is a, that is my point Reverend Jack I think most people agree that on a t on uh, you know that technically perhaps reasonable doubt was there and I think that there is there are many many Americans who believe that the trial uh, the, the the evidence was screwed up and so on however uh, you know there was blood all over Brentwood I mean there there was a problem there is no there are no other suspects uh, do you believe that he's going to go out and look for the real killers well, I, I, I do not know that, but I do not know how any of us who are, are looking on TV and, in this instance, Monday, mon Monday morning quarterbacking can just dismiss the jury. I don't think anybody wants to dismiss the jury. The jury did not our, find him innocent. They found him not guilty. Let's well, go to a bigger question then, but can, can I, Jackson. Can I, can I, can I, I, I don't, I, I don't want to put you in a position Roger, defending ma, ma, it. Ma, ma, I don't want to attack Roger, the jury, and I don't want you to point? be in a position to defending it. Let me just say this. What is the impact on race relations in America, Reverend Jackson? What is the impact? Let's get to the larger question, because oh, I think we could talk all night about the jury, and I don't think we'd get anywhere. Well, for, well, for a while, it's going to be a, a real ugly season. I want to say, let's distinguish between race and racism. For the first few months of this trial, you notice there were no demonstrations and counter-demonstrations. Race was always a factor. An African-American male accused of killing a white woman and, and a Jewish male, but no one accused O.J. of being racist because of his lifestyle, the way he operated. They said he was jealous and full of rage and full of passion, but not racism. You had Marsha Clark and Darden, you had uh, uh, the lawyers uh, on the other side, uh, uh, Johnny Cochran uh, and Shapiro and the like, a Japanese American judge and the integrated jury. And so we just all kind of watched the Furman factor change the tone and temperature of this trial. And right now, there is more of an attack on the jury's judgment than on a policeman who perjured himself. I don't think and anybody I in America, I, I don't think anybody in America supports Mark Furman. I, I don't think he has one ounce of support anywhere. Maybe well, well, I'll tell you what, well, I'll tell you what, he was um, at least a factor in this conclusion. Let me tell you what I see as, as the fallout. Uh, with so much angry reaction say, Marsha Clark's statement about the jury and Shapiro's statement about the dream team, the trying of this trial uh, after it's over in, uh, in, 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 in a real sense, is that many Americans are now making decisions that go beyond the trial. I've heard people say things like, because of this, I don't support affirmative action. Well, that's uh, nonsense. Those people, I, 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 those no, people in, will indeed. calm down and get back. That's I, crazy. I, I, they shouldn't well, do that. Well, we, we, we hope so. I, I, I talked with two security guards yesterday uh, from Bel Air who have been relieved from their job. Uh, Oprah Winfrey talked about the bellman at, at her uh, building in Chicago who whites were not giving tips. And I'm saying that during all of this anger uh, and hurt and reaction, uh, let's cool down the rhetoric and let's give ourselves some time for healing and rational thinking. I agree with that. Uh does O.J. still think he's a hero, and do the African-Americans still view him as a hero? No, O.J. was an athletic hero. 
He is in this trial that that's 30 a seconds, symbol. Uh, Reverend Jackson, I've got to take uh, a break in 30. Go ahead. But my point, O.J., is, is a symbol. It became, O.J., the symbol in the criminal justice system, perhaps versus Mark Furman, uh, the policeman. But there is no basis for celebration, maybe relief. There were two people dead and two children motherless and reputation destroyed all over the place. Got to go. Some basis for relief, but no basis for celebration. Be right back. I think that the O.J. verdict is the best thing that's happened to America in quite a while because I don't believe in denial of reality. And the reality is there is a big problem between the races, and it's good that it's out. I'd like to hear O.J. say what really happened. Um, I think he knows something about the murders, um, although I don't think he did it, but I'd like for him to just be honest. Reverend Jackson, if you claim you're not a racist, then how can you rightly endorse the Million Man March? Farrakhan's message is good to a point, but he's an anti-Semite, he's an anti-Semite, and he's anti-white. So how can you, in all good faith, endorse that and then say you're for good race relations? I had not seen that clip. I uh, and uh, Reverend Jackson and I were talking in the break. First, I'd like to apologize for cutting away so quickly. Before I get to that guy's question, that was a man on the street. Uh, you and I were talking in the break. Why do blacks and whites view this O.J. thing so differently, Reverend Jackson? You know, it could be, Roger, if, if you and I are looking at the same apple, and you're looking top down, you see a, a shiny red apple. I'm looking bottom up, and I see the rot in the apple. We're looking at the same apple, but we see two very different things. As we talk today, one of every three African-American males, 20 to 29, is in the jail industrial complex at the cost of $6 billion a year. The present urban policy uh, is a negative one. Welfare, uh, chastisement for the mothers, and jails for the youth, rather than jobs for parents, and, uh, and education for the youth. So that's a tremendous amount of pain in black America. And I tell you, the sense of, of isolation uh, and the oppression is becoming more intense. Didn't we get off the track back in the Great Society in 1964 under Johnson when instead of creating programs for African Americans and poor, which allowed them low interest loans at 1%, uh, incentive to get off welfare, we in fact put them into an endless uh, government handout program in which they had no obligation to pay back, and, and we created generation of welfare, whereas had we, as you say, put money into education, put money into low income, uh, uh, into uh, but, low but interest what happened, loans, Roger, it, wouldn't it, we have it, it created, not, do you believe that that incentive might have helped the African Americans? You know, the, the programs of the Great Society, which wiped out malnutrition, the war on poverty, which, which trained many Americans from West Virginia whites to, to Harlem blacks, sure. that's not what happened. What really happened is the impact of the economic downsizing. Uh, 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 jobs are out. Uh, tax base eroding, middle class down, poverty base exploding. Taxes are exploding. up quite a bit from those days. At least uh, mine are. Maybe I'm you, getting. Screwed. I submit to you today, if that is a plan to reinvest in and reindustrialize urban America, there'll be a turnaround. The two newest buildings in urban America, wherever you go, Roger, will be a new ballpark and a new jail. And between these two big mountains, there is no industry. So that's a kind of canyon, a double sucking sound. Jobs sucked out. Uh, and our youth sucked up. We need a, this is a state of emergency. We need a renewed commitment, those 1% loans you talk about, right. a plan to green line, red line America, reindustrialize and put America back to work. That's your alternative to welfare, and it's a key for family stability. Let me switch for a second now. That man on the street was, how can you endorse, or how, how can you side with uh, Minister Farrakhan when in fact he has said some very insulting things about Judaism, which is a 2,000 year old, 2,000 years before Christ, a covenant between uh, God and Abraham. This goes back a long ways. This is a, uh, you know, a, a respected uh, religion in the world, and he insulted it and didn't apologize for it. Should he apologize for it? Well, l let me say this to you, Roger. This march, while Minister Farrakhan is a factor, this march is not Farrakhan-centered. It is ecumenical in its base. But he seems to be it's the a, it, well, Hear me now. 
Well, that, that seems to be a, a broad base of leadership. Of course, driving this march is the objective predicament of black America. Uh, we are under attack by the courts and by, and by the Congress. Uh, our babies die early because of infant mortality. We are less able to get a primary or secondary education. This is well documented. We are less able to get loans to join the American economic system. Last year in San Diego, 30,000 mortgage loans, only 29 went to black. But, but we, Reverend we Jackson, let me, let me back up for a second. There have been, blacks have been persecuted in America and have been treated very badly over the years. Uh, there's been a lot of movement in the last 30, 40 years to try to atone for that. Uh, the Jewish people have been persecuted for thousands and thousands of years. You would think there would be a natural alliance between these two people. Why would Farrakhan take the position that he does against the Jews? That's a question that the man well, on the street has. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I ha First, I'm responsible for my own position. Right. I believe that the peoples and the religions must be reconciled. Fortunately, in this march, the, the basic theme is atonement and reconciliation. I uh, understand that Mr. Farrakhan this week has sent a letter to uh, Mr. Foxman of, of the ADL seeking a meeting when this uh, march is over. I hope that's followed through on. I believe, Roger, if in our lifetime we can see Arafat and Perez and Rabin strike a new accord where that was bloodletting between the two, if we can see the clerk and, and Mandela do it in South Africa, it can happen in our own country. And we must make certain that this march on Monday has a moral tone of reconciliation and redemption. Why and are white people not invited to the march? Hurt. Are white people going to be I, in this march? You know, perhaps they will, but their emphasis is upon black people asserting themselves, black men standing up, are not surrendering. Many black men. But if they're, uh, but if this is a, a march of reconciliation, wouldn't you think all people should be invited? Well, I to reconcile what, our differences. Well, I, I think the emphasis is on blacks. Uh, in this instance, it's on black males standing up. What do they need but to atone not, but for? Let, 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 let me. Well, uh, the argument that some make is that some black men, uh, in the face of, of oppression, have done less than their best. Many. Uh, have, 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 have surrendered to the drug uh, trade. Others have uh, made babies and not raised them, that we have not been as, as good as we could have been. It's like Nehemiah's atonement. He spoke of rebuilding the wall, but it's not just atonement. It's Reverend. also a commitment to rebuild the wall and to build a coalition. If three million Got to go to a break here. I, I apologize. Roger, I apologize again, everybody. but they cut us off. I'll pick you up right after the break. Hold, it, hold that thought. We'll be right back. back with the uh, head of the Rainbow Coalition, Reverend Jesse Jackson. Uh, Reverend Jackson, you were starting to say, you and I were kibitzing in the break there about uh, this march. Why are you going? What, tell me what's going I, on. I was, I, what I was saying, that in, in the book of, of Nehemiah, when you look back and the walls are down, he atoned by saying, maybe I've done less than my best. But then he went on beyond the atonement and said, now let us rebuild the wall. And in some sense, when, I'm go when I go, if we could get a million men, for example, to move to reclaim their children, suppose we could get a million men to do five things. Take your child to school, meet your child's teachers, exchange home numbers, turn off the TV three hours a night, and pick up a report card every nine weeks. That joint venture between those men and teachers could have a tremendous impact upon salvaging our children. Suppose a million men were to get three other people to register and vote. That would have a tremendous impact up on the political elections at every level of government in 1996. And so there is in this march some tremendous uh, positive potential for the good. And, and I your hope poll that it numbers will be just realized. Went down, your poll numbers just went down with kids by turning off the TV and making them study at night three hours. But, but, I, but I'll tell you what, if somehow, if, if turning TV off today will have them in college rather than jail tomorrow, uh, I, I'll live with that. Okay. All right, kids, he doesn't care about your poll numbers. That's it. All right, Reverend Jackson, let's move on to, uh, to another subject here for a second. Colin Powell, I know you know uh, Colin Powell. I know Colin Powell. Uh, he's a uh, uh, distinguished American. He's considering, I don't know if he's considering, I think he's considering the presidency. Uh, if you were, uh, and this is hard talking to a guy who's run for president, but if you were his political advisor, would you tell him to go or not go? We have some real hard choices. Um, 
Uh, you know, as a successful, popular ex-general and now book author, he's in a rather non-threatening stratosphere. The closer he moves to the playing field where it is competitive and threatening, some who are saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, will begin to say, crucify him, crucify him. It's a different temperature, as you know, on the playing field. Uh, the choice obviously is his. He has the unique appeal, uh, and I'm convinced he has the skill. Whether or not he has the will to engage in this bloody political battle, which is a long-term struggle, I just don't know. But I tell you, even, even the speculation about his running, in my judgment, has been good for the American political dialogue. Do you, uh, are, are you suggesting perhaps that, that uh, you know, people will tear him down, the press will tear him down once he gets in? Well, the same press that represents a tale when the day would be a hit when the next day, you, you've been there. Yeah, I've been there. Uh, <laughs> it, you've been there. If he, if he runs uh, as a Republican, he'll have to be an acolyte and an awful lot of poison, a lot of his views don't sit well with the present uh, Republican Party structure. Uh, if he runs a Democrat, he'd have to face a, a sitting president who controls the, the apparatus. That would be a tough battle. If he ran as an independent, that's 13 months of campaigning and, and fundraising without the financial base, say, of a Ross Perot. So at that level, those are very hard choices. But I tell you, he has so much to offer, whether he runs for presidency or serves in some other capacity, uh, he is a great American with an awful lot to offer all of us. Do you differ with him enough on the issues so that you two couldn't run as a team, or, or are you close enough on issues that you possibly could? You know well, not so well. much as a Not so much as a team, but in mutually supportive roles. For example, we've been in real dialogue for about the last 10 years uh, on various matters, whether it was the latter days of the South African struggle, which fortunately we all uh, ended up with a position we can all live with, and now there's a a free South Africa, of which America was a big factor, uh, getting, uh, I, I went to uh, uh, Kuwait, you know, and Iraq, uh, and brought 500 Americans out there before the war started. I came back, I, I debriefed him, and he uh, said to me, I hope uh, that you will go back and talk with Hussein again uh, and convince him to pull back, because if he does not, we're going to drive him back. Uh, he was rather uh, adamant about that, and of course, he did just that. We communicated right through the Haitian crisis, so we've, we've talked on matters of substance for about the last 10 years. I tell you, he, he is what people see, a, a very strong, uh, uh, able, uh, intelligent man with, uh, with, with a curious mind. And I'm convinced that, uh, that many of his best days of public service are yet in front of him. Most of his success in his career came under Republican presidents, Ronald Reagan, George Bush. Does it shock you that he holds some Republican views? Well, it, it does not. It does not shock me that some Republican views and some Democratic views on matters of national security are, 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 are the same. Uh, he uh, got public accommodations, uh, the right to use a, a motel, hotel, park, a library on the Democrats. He got the right to vote on the Democrats. He got uh, his general, his, his, uh, his stars on the call of the affirmative action program. So he has benefited from Democrats and worked with Republicans. So he has uh, rode the elephant and the donkey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, under what conditions would you run again? Well, it remains a very live option. I, I tell you right now. You're thinking uh, about it, I aren't you? You're really thinking I, about it. I, I, I am because we were about to have a thing called city vote to the vote to debate urban policy where there's so much pain we were told 30 years ago by the Colonel Commission, we were going to have two societies, one essentially white and have, another black and brown and have not. It would tear our nation apart. We're just there, Roger, today, and nothing is being done about it. That concerns me very much. And so whether uh, I challenge this president, which I would be reluctant to do, or run as an independent, that decision has not yet been made. But I tell you, all options are live until we get urban policy debated and something done about it again. Let me make a, you know, in, in terms of urban policy, that's generally a, a, a code word for putting more money into the inner cities and putting more money into the cities. And you, that's an arguable number. I mean, some Republicans will say, you know, you should put some in, but not so much. Democrats may say, let's put more. Is the issue money? And if it is money, 
How much money will it take to wipe out poverty? Let's just it, let's it, say let's say the American people are willing to write a check one time, but let's get it over with. Let's let's well, solve it. Well, how much money? Well, do we first, need? first of all, if we can stop redlining investment and start greenlining with investment, isn't redlining that's not illegal? A, that, 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 that redlining is illegal, but redlining is taking place. And well, they to put them in jail if it's illegal. Indeed, the Community Reinvestment Act has not been on it. That's a thing that can happen. Secondly, we ought to know that prenatal care, Head Start, and daycare on the front side of life as investments cost less than jail, can't and wealth How much on the money? What do we need? Ten billion, a hundred billion? Let's suppose everybody you know, with money sure. in the country got together and said, look, let's not have this fight anymore. We don't need any poor people. How much is it going to cost to get them on their feet, buy them a house, and well, get them well, a job? Well, first of all, poor people are not just in the inner city, number one. And number two, poor, poor people are in the majority of white and female and young. It's neither in the city issue nor is it a race issue. I, I, here's my plan. Well, we have four trillion dollars in private and public pension funds. Uh, we could take 10% of that, uh, government secured, uh, and or uh, a, a moderate uh, uh, a gas tax hike, set up development banks and reinvest in America as we have in other countries, begin to use the workers' money with workers' consent to rebuild our infrastructure and put Americans, black and white, back together. Given the impact of economic downsizing on all workers, there must be some plan to reinvest in America's infrastructure. And that way, working people can stabilize their families, and that becomes the alternative to welfare and family destruction. How do you interest a young African American or any young kid in an inner city in a job that pays even ten or fifteen dollars an hour when he can make fifteen hundred bucks a week on the street pushing drugs or uh, doing something else. How do well, you interest a kid most, in doing that? Most inner city kids are not pushing drugs but all too many are victims of the drug trade. I'll tell you what pains me very much about that since you've raised it. Five grams of crack cocaine, first time nonviolent offense, five years mandatory in jail. 500 grams of powder cocaine, you can get probation. Powder is wholesale, crack is retail. 75% of those with powder cocaine are white males, 94% with the $5 high are young black males. Should now, pushers get the way, death penalty? Well, not necessarily. I, I think that may be too harsh, but I tell you, something is wrong when you would have to have $45,000 worth of uh, marijuana to be in jail five years. 8,000 worth of powder to be in jail five years, but only $29 worth of crack. That, the U.S. Sentencing Commission has said that that is wrong, it's racist, it's much too costly, and time and crime do not correspond. Reverend Jackson, I've got a couple minutes left here. Are, are race relations worse or better? Are, are whites suspicious of blacks and blacks suspicious of whites to a, to a greater degree today than say 20 years ago or 25 years ago when you really got out front on the civil rights movement, uh, went through a lot of marches uh, and made speeches. Well, are, 20 are, years we getting, ago, Roger, are we getting closer together or are we further apart? 20 years ago, that was the up feeling. We were overcoming legal segregation. Right. We were overcoming the denial based upon the embarrassing, humiliating signs of racial division for the first time getting the right to vote people like Lyndon Johnson in the White House. But in the latter years, with the economic insecurity, there has been a, a lot of exploitation of race and, and not much caring for building racial bridges. Uh, politicians, Jesse Hams ran uh, using the ad you recall of using a white hand uh, being pushed away by a black hand to incite fear. The kind of things we've heard from, from, from talk show hosts, I say, there's just been too much race baiting by credible people, and race baiting is so dangerous and so violent and so immoral and so un-American, we just must stop and tone down the rhetoric and build bridges and make this one America an America for all of our people. Okay, I, I appreciate your comments. We're wrapping up here. I've got to take a break. Uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson, good to see you again. When you're back in New York, come and see me. We, we were going to have I dinner promise. to talk this out. We're going to solve this problem once and for all, you and I. We'll do it soon, and when I make my move, I know who's going to be my uh, chief fundraiser and consultant, Roger, and that will <laughs> shake up everybody. <laughs> That'll shake them up. All right, we'll be back with an amusing character. Uh, Pat Cooper is with us tonight. This guy I've known for a long time, too. I've known Mr. Jackson for many years. I've known